Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Asia Impact webinar uh, of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, the title of this webinar is um, uh, Transforming uh, Bangladesh's Participation in Trade and Global Value Chain Participation. Um, in this uh, webinar, what we will be doing is uh, presenting the initial findings of our study related to Bangladesh's uh, uh, participation in global value chain, more specifically, and in general, uh, the interconnection uh, between uh, the consumption, production, and trade that is related to Bangladesh's economic activities. Um, we will uh, be presenting our initial findings uh, and also we will be requesting uh, the panelists to provide insights uh, uh, based on uh, the results we uh, present, but also based on their expertise and experience. So to start with, uh, I will be uh, requesting uh, my colleagues, uh, Karishma Banga and um, uh, Janine uh, Lasatin to present uh, the, our initial findings. Both uh, Karishma and Janine um, have been uh, leading this uh, initiative, uh, this study, and they have also been uh, providing uh, inputs to various uh, GVC related studies of our unit. Uh, over to you, uh, Karishma and Janine. Um, hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us today. Let me just share our presentation with you. All right, so um, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. So what Krishma and I will be presenting um, are just some trade statistics and GVC statistics in the first part. And then Karishma will talk about um, transformation in Bangladesh using um, digitalization as well, right? So um, this is this shows Bangladesh's um, GDP growth over the years. And what we can see here is that since the 1980s, decade by decade, GDP has been growing at a faster rate each decade, except of course in 20, like 2020 to 2027, um, so where we see a slower growth compared to the decade 2010s, um, mainly because again of the COVID pandemic and the many um, uh, economic or macroeconomic, global macroeconomic challenges that um, Bangladesh and other countries face today. Um, this growth has been largely driven by the Bangladesh's export orientedness, especially in the um, ready-made garment sector, which has provided uh, millions of jobs, low-skilled jobs um, to uh, the Bangladesh economy, right? When we look at exports, um, we use here the ADB MRIOT. So this would include even exports in um, services. And what we see is really a high concentration in the textile and textile sectors from um, over 75%. Um, it has lowered to uh, about 75% in recent years because of the increase in the post and telecommunication sector. But uh, when we look at just the uh, merchandise exports, um, what we plot here is um, the HHI or the Herfand Hirschman Herfindel Index for Bangladesh using just the products. So this excludes services. And what we see is increasing concentration um, from 2005, 2010, 2015, and 2020. And this is mainly because within their product mix, um, their textiles has been dominating um, their export product exports throughout these years. I think in 2020, it has reached over 83% of um, exports. So meaning um, um, as your HHI increases, it means that your economy is becoming more concentrated. And when we compare Bangladesh um, to its other competitors in the textile industry, like Cambodia, India, Pakistan, PRC, and Vietnam, what we see is that Bangladesh is showing the highest concentration in product exports amongst, amongst these economies. And when we look at the role of Bangladesh in total product exports, what we see is that Bangladesh plays a small role when we consider all total merchandise exports. But when we consider just textile products, of course, um, the PRC still takes up the largest share. But Bangladesh here is now a significant contributor to the exports of textile and textile products. So the difference here is um, a stark comparison between what uh, Bangladesh 
can offer and um, Bangladesh's current offering of the textile and textile products. So there, you see a high concentration in Bangladesh, again, of textile products. And what we see here, um, we have highlighted um, Bangladesh's connections or the top three export markets for Bangladesh. And we see that um, the, um, their products mostly go to Germany, USA, um, Great Britain, and some other EU nations as well. Okay, again, this chart tells us that we compare economies of the same <clears throat> size and also economies with um, uh, who are Bangladesh's competitors in the um, textile market or textile exports market. And we see that Bangladesh has room to grow in terms of trade openness for its size. And one way to do to do this is to increase exports and imports through um, participation in global value chains, which I'll go to next, okay? Right. So um, this is um, Bangladesh's current exports that we decomposed into certain value added categories, okay? What we see is if we look at just the light blue and the green bars, this is um, what you call the trade participation, uh, trade-based GVC participation. What we see is that Bangladesh's um, export is actually 70% non-GVC value added, okay? So meaning um, only 30% of Bangladesh's total exports over the years are related to GVCs, okay? Um, when we consider production-based um, GVCs, um, Alawang Wei, Yu, and Zhu, this is a different methodology from just the decomposition. We see a large portion, uh, the dark blue portion, is um, simple GVCs. If we consider just um, uh, Bangladesh's direct intermediate exports to the next economy, which the next economy uses. So it's more of um, a simple GVC um, setup for Bangladesh, but we, we want them to be engaged more in also complex GVCs because complex GVCs gives them the um, uh, opportunity to sort of um, capture um, tech from upstream and downstream industries, apart from Bangladesh. So it kind of helps them deepen their participation in GVCs, increase trade, and increase trade. Okay. Um, what again, what the last chart shows us is um, a small participation rate for Bangladesh. And when we compare Bangladesh to other economies of the same size and also um, their direct competitors, what we see is Bangladesh really participates um, quite uh, low for in GVCs. And we when we compare to the world economy, which is total world, we see an average of about 40 to 50% participation rate in GVCs. But for Bangladesh, it's just about 20 to 30%. So there's room for Bangladesh to further increase its participation in GVCs, right? Um, and, but um, again, because of the dominance of the textile sector, we are seeing um, a large um well a, a small or a, a short or a sorry low participation in gvcs because of the low gvc participation of the textile industries but when we break it down by sector we see like varying degrees of um participation but overall what we're seeing is that again it's a high FBA or a high backward participation economy where it gets a lot of its inputs from foreign um, value added for GVCs and then like a, a comparatively lower FBA um, sector. And uh, later, what we'll see is that machineries and um, some other um, sectors have uh, our RCA sectors for Bangladesh or our competitive sectors for Bangladesh, where they can try and increase exports because they already have some competitiveness in that sector. And again, increase their overall participation in GVCs and um, increase trade in general to promote economic growth or further economic growth. Okay, This is my last slide, which ranks um, RCA using both gross exports and value added exports. So they're just two different ways of computing for revealed comparative advantage with um, RCA computed by value added using forward value added. So it takes into account even the indirect exports of that sector. And what we're seeing again is a high dominant or of the textile industry. Um, what we see is that um, over 20, like um, when we compare the textile sector exports of 
Bangladesh to the world economy, it's over times 20%, right? Times 20, sorry. And then um, next we see, again, we see telecommunications, which is also part of the top exporting sectors we saw earlier in the, I think, third slide. Um, Post and telecoms actually helps Bangladesh or contributes a lot of exports to Bangladesh as well, with it showing an RCA of 10 using gross exports and um, a little over five using um, value added. But again, um, what we also see here is that leathers, which is a related sector to textiles or like a close rela re closely related tech, uh, sector to textiles, is actually also an RCA um, sector for the economy. And there's also public ad construction and then other manufacturing, which includes manufacturing of our different kinds of appliances. So given, given these um, RCA sectors, it means that Bangladesh can, there's still room for Bangladesh to increase its um, gross exports among these competitive sectors, but it can also, you know, try to build up some RCA in other sectors as well through investments in these other sectors and through um, open policies that encourage production and exports within these other sectors, right? Um, again, so we see here some other sectors where Bangladesh can actually um, step into or sectors where RCA could be further improved and help Bangladesh transform the economy. And so Karishma will be discussing that in her slides, right? So um, I'll hand this over to Karishma now to continue with the discussion. Thank you, thanks Janine. Um, so I think Janine's point around um, the competitive advantage that uh, Bangladesh has in telecommunications is a nice segue into the next section um, of the presentation, which looks at economic transformation in Bangladesh and scoping the role of digitalization in facilitating that. So um, we think there's an urgent need for economic transformation in Bangladesh. And this is because some of the recent developments that are challenging the sustainability of garments-led manufacturing um, export-led model that Bangladesh has so far uh, used. And uh, these developments include um, rise, rising wages, wages in Bangladesh's manufacturing sector, which are expected to rise further after uh, the graduation uh, from the LDC status. Uh, we also saw that the ready-made garment sector was particularly hit during the COVID-19 crisis due to uh, demand-side disruptions and canceling of export orders from Europe and US. Uh, so we def definitely there was you know, vulnerability within that sector. And there are also lots of global changes happening in the manufacturing landscape, including the rise of Industry 4.0, digitalization and automation that is changing competitive advantages and lowering the importance of having uh, you know, lower wages in determining that competitiveness. And uh, digitalization will not only have, you know, a direct impact on Bangladesh's um, sort of uh, production, but also an indirect impact, uh, potentially through reduced inward FDI or, you know, limited offshoring of jobs in the future or competitive pressures on wages. So therefore, we think it's important to look at economic transformation. And we conceptualize that using uh, Macmillan and Roderick's approach. And we define economic transformation as a continued process of structural change, which is moving labor away from low productivity sectors to higher productivity sectors. So for example, the shift from agriculture to manufacturing to services, which has traditionally been used, um, you know, has played a substantial role in the productivity catch up of developing countries. So uh, one way is structural change or the other way is uh, raising the productivity growth within a particular sector. And this can happen through reallocation of resources from low productivity firms to higher productivity firms. Uh, but also within a firm, it can happen from movement um, from low efficiency product lines to higher efficiency product lines. Uh, so for example, one of the studies on Bangladesh's garments uh, manufacturing shows that actually the most efficient product line is two thirds more efficient uh, than the least efficient product line. So efficiencies also differ across products. And another channel of raising productivity growth is through trade, through value chain participation and um, you know, a complex production structure. So that's, those are the two drivers we're looking at and uh, labor productivity growth can be decomposed into these two segments or two components. So one is the between sector component which captures the structural change and the other is the within sector component which is because of the productivity growth within a particular sector. So we use this framework and we use this decomposition on Bangladesh. And we find that actually structural change in Bangladesh has increased over time and it has been growth enhancing, right? 
but the within sector component still drives majority of the productivity growth. So if you look here on the, on the bars, the blue segment um, shows the within sector productivity growth um, in a particular sector, and the orange portion uh, depicts the structural change, which is the movement from agriculture to manufacturing to services, which is driving uh, that share, which is driving the, uh, the productivity uh, growth in, in Bangladesh. Here we take a closer look at structural change. So we are mapping the relative labor productivity um, of different sectors uh, with the percentage point change in employment shares. And here the size of the bubble represents the overall or the total number of people employed in each sector. And here we see that in the initial period uh, from 2005 to 2010, there was a movement of workers away from the agricultural sector to the higher productivity manufacturing sector. Whereas in the later periods from 2015 to 2018, uh, we see that there is a clear movement of workers from the agriculture and the manufacturing sector into the services sector, which is a relatively more productive uh, sector. So again, going back to the point around structural change that has uh, been happening in Bangladesh. However, a continued challenge to uh, increasing structural transformation in Bangladesh is the fact that economic complexity is actually declining. So uh, here we've tried to map out the economic complexity of different uh, countries over time. And we find that actually Bangladesh has, uh, the rank of Bangladesh is, um, its economic complexity has gone down, right? So it used to rank 89 and now it ranks uh, 93 um, in, in 2020. And it's actually lower than its comparators, uh, Cambodia and Vietnam uh, in 2020. And if you look at Vietnam, so over 2000, from 2005 onwards, you see that there is a significant progress in terms of uh, economic complexity. And that's because Vietnam added about 44 new products into its export basket. And these were also high income per capita products. Um, as opposed to Bangladesh, which uh, added about 10 uh, products, and uh, these were also low in terms of income per capita. And as a result, Bangladesh continued to be sort of specialized in the low complexity products like textile. So that's the cluster of green dots that we see here. And there is some movement into other products as well. So that's the, the yellow dots that we see are some of them are the leather products or agricultural uh, products. But there are few opportunities to diversify into related products because of the nature of uh, textile. And it is cut off from the, you know, uh, the know-how of other products, for example, electronics, which is like this bottom left uh, cluster of products uh, that we see. So then we try to understand whether digitalization can actually kickstart the next phase of structural transformation in Bangladesh. And uh, we find that there is significant heterogeneity in terms of digital transformation within manufacturing sectors in Bangladesh. Um, and the top most digitalized sector is the computer electronics and optical equipment sector. Uh, followed by the electrical machinery and apparatus sector, uh, whereas the, the labor intensive sectors like leather and leather footwear or textile and textile products are, you know, one of the, they're the least digitalized sectors in the economy, which is not surprising and it follows global trends um, as well as what we see in other uh, developing countries. But um, our firm level analysis using the World Bank Enterprise uh, Survey does suggest that there is a strong correlation between uh, digitalization in manufacturing and economic transformation in Bangladesh. So here we look at very simple indicators of digitalization, such as whether firms have, you know, are using emails to communicate with clients or have a web presence. Uh, but we find that there are significant differences in average productivity levels um, across firms that are using email um, or a web presence versus those that are not. And these differences are statistically significant um, as well. And uh, following on from that, we also find, so here we try to model the probability of a firm, a Bangladeshi manufacturing firm to link into value chains. And we find that um, firms that are digitalized, so these are the ones that are using um, email, for instance, uh, they have a higher probability of linking into global value chains um, as opposed to firms that are not digitalized, uh, controlling for other factors like the presence of an ISO certificate, productivity of the firm, size of the firm, um, year and industry fixed effects. Uh, so that's what we see from models uh, one and two. And to reduce endogeneity in the model, because we know that you know, value chain participation can also lead to adoption of uh, technology, uh, we use here another indicator, which is the percentage of digital firms in the industry in which the firm is participating. So this is measured at the sectoral uh, sector level. 
And here again, we find that although the economic and statistical significance has gone down, uh, digitalization seems to be positively correlated with uh, value chain participation. And uh, similarly, when we look at export intensity, intensity more broadly, uh, using Heckman selection models, we find that firms that are digitalized are not only more likely to enter the export market, but they are also more likely to have higher export intensity um, through digitalization. Um, again, controlling for firm industry and, and time fixed effects. But interestingly, we are seeing that the scope of the digital led, uh, digital driven transformation in Bangladesh is actually slowing down, right? Which um, really highlights the need for urgent and targeted investments into this sector and into linking the sector with other domestic sectors of the economy. Because we see that the, 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 the trade in digital services, whether that's ICT services or digitally deliverable services, has actually been declining post uh, 2016. So here we see the exports of ICT services. Um, as a share of total trade in services going down, which is the green line, um, as well as the share of digitally deliverable services. And uh, even the contribution of the digital sector to GDP, which is on an average about 2.5%, but there seems to be a declining trend there as well in terms of its contribution to, uh, to GDP. Um, and so this is what, you know, the emerging findings from our analysis, but we are also working, um, so our forthcoming analysis looks at substantiating the story uh, by undertaking a, a deep dive into product level analysis, trying to really understand which six digit products uh, Bangladesh is building competitive in, competitiveness in, and where there's an actual scope to diversify, looking at what they're currently exporting, um, and linking that with data on FDI to really understand where the FDI flows are going and which countries are making those investments that can enhance export diversification. Um, and looking at digital-led economic transformation by taking a deep dive into which digital capabilities are being built at the firm level, and particularly the role of logistics and e-commerce in facilitating this uh, transformation. So we hope to share that uh, with you um, as well in some time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karishma and Janine, for presenting our preliminary results. Uh, so to start the uh, discussion, uh, let me first introduce our panel. Um, we are joined by Dr. Zaidi Sattar, uh, Chairman of the uh, Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh, with uh, deep experience in uh, Bangladesh economy and um, has been uh, advising various international organizations on uh, Bangladesh-related projects. Um, Eddie Mond Ginting, uh, Country Director for uh, ADB, and uh, Pramila uh, Kaiveli, um, She's an economist, uh, trade economist at uh, ADB as well. So to start the discussion, uh, Dr. Sattar, maybe uh, I can um, tap into your uh, experience uh, with uh, Bangladesh. Um, from the data that we see, uh, it appears um, there is very there are very limited avenues for diversification uh, as we see it. So I'm wondering, uh, given your expertise and experience related to Bangladesh, uh, if you see um, the potential that we don't see uh, in uh, in the Bangladesh uh, Bangladesh's economy diversifying. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, Mahin, and uh, thank you uh, to the uh, presenters. I, I think uh, they have brought some very new new ideas. Uh, to the table on how to look at Bangladesh's future prospects uh, in its exports as well as in its potential for diversification, in its potential for raising productivity, digitalization, uh, etc. So I think uh, there are, I can see some new ways of looking at Bangladesh's uh, current status and future potential. Uh, very fascinating. Thank you. Um, so let me, uh, you know, partly I will react to some of the points made and partly I will make my own observations as to how I see things developing. Uh, yes, I think uh, the, the takeaway, the main takeaway from uh, the presentations we've seen is that basically Bangladesh's export basket is uh, too concentrated. The Herfindahl index seems to have been growing and compared to other competitors or comparators, Bangladesh's export basket is just too, too concentrated. And the 
when it looks at the scope of uh, diversifying, uh, the, the mapping that we have seen, a global mapping and the mapping of uh, different uh, sectors uh, tells us that, um, I mean, uh, the research seems to point to the fact that Bangladesh, given its current uh, concentration in the textile sector, the scope for ex extending or diversifying its product base uh, seems a bit distant because you know, it's it's not linked or close to the the other, uh, you know, fast growing sectors like uh, uh, more digitized sectors, uh, the electronic sectors, for instance. So, uh, that said, I think uh, let's let's go back a little bit and look at Bangladesh's initial conditions uh, of uh, the current uh, situation. Uh, Bangladesh began uh, with an concentrated export basket, which was, you know, 75% of Bangladesh's export in the 1970s was made up with jute and jute products. So that was an export concentration. And then, but the uh, ready-made garment sector came in uh, thanks to uh, the, the leverage, the leveraging of uh, the international market through the multi-fiber arrangement, which gave the the market access part to Bangladesh, and then you know, um, thanks to some um, advice and, uh, and investment from uh, international, you know, multinational firms like uh, Korean firms, uh, Bangladesh l launched the uh, ready-made garment industry, which, uh, in spite of the fact that Bangladesh neither grew cotton nor had a textile sector, which was really internationally competitive. So it was sort of a leap of faith for Bangladesh, but it did it. There, is, there are two things that, that went for it. One is Bangladesh's competitive advantage in labor intensive production. That is one of the fundamental theorems of trade, uh, you know, gives you uh, that answer that here is a labor intensive product and Bangladesh could do very well in uh, producing and exporting uh, this particular pr product. So this is what we call a triumph of comparative advantage theory. So that's the theoretical part. The other thing is Bangladesh had, you know, adopted a trade policy regime that was highly restrictive and highly protectionist, uh, you know, an import substituting regime to, uh, uh, that was uh, existing at that time. And it, sort of drew from past uh, policies, no change. In order for Bangladesh to exploit its uh, labor, uh, labor cost advantage and leverage the world market, it had to develop, it had to sort of innovate a, a trade policy regime that was going to be favorable for this labor intensive product export. And therefore what Bangladesh did was a policy innovation, which is, create a sort of enclave or a free trade channel for this ready-made garment sector, uh, which allowed it to import all its inputs duty-free. Mind you, when it started, when, when this industry was launched, 90% of the inputs had to be imported. So global GVC, Bangladesh was very early on, it was a participant in the GVC. 90% uh, of inputs had to be uh, imported duty free and that is what gave it the 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 uh, scope to leverage uh, the world market based on its own competitive advantage which is low labor cost now uh, now uh, fast forward uh, 20 uh, 2000s bangladesh's uh, in the mid, in the early 1990s, Bangladesh became more concentrated in ready-made garments. So the earlier concentration on jute and jute products, which was more close to a primary product, Bangladesh became a manufacturing exporter, and but its concentration in exports again reached about 70% in the early to mid 1990s. Starting 2000 and currently, as you know, that concentration kept on growing. And all your you know, calculations uh, confirm that Bangladesh is now highly concentrated and it, that concentration is not 
going away, it's only increasing. So whereas it was only 75% in 2000, it has now reached the concentration in ready-made garments has reached 83%. So, but Bangladesh is 95% a manufacturing exporter, but 95% of its exports are also consumer goods. So as far as intermediate goods is concerned, that, that uh, you know, um, con I, I mean, that prospect of global trade, where trade in intermediate goods, trade in value added, that is the substance of this GVCs, that Bangladesh has not been actually able to take advantage of these transformations in global trade. So Bangladesh continues to be an exporter of final product, consumer goods in particular, and, um, and it is unable uh, as yet to move into the non-garment exporting sector. But I, as I was talking, you know, prior to this particular, uh, prior to the presentations, we have a policy problem. It's not just that uh, you, what you have shown uh, in terms of the mapping of the products and the, their interlinkages, uh, the scope for uh, moving into other uh, products. Uh, there is, apart from that problem, there is a, what we call a policy problem. And Bangladesh has not been able to come out of, uh, come out of that import substituting constraint and the protectionist uh, uh, regime that we have. On the one hand, we have a garment sector which is doing fantastic, taking advantage of its labor costs and taking um, leveraging the world market for uh, ready-made garments, which had we had some you know short um, you know setback during the COVID and crisis. But you know I'm, I'm not it's not cancellation. More of that more of the orders were actually um, uh, postponed, so suspended. So later on. If you look at the 2021 exports, uh, Bangladesh exports picked up. In 2022, there was a surge in exports, 35% uh, surge in exports. So what I'm saying is that when it comes to the non-garment sector exports, Bangladesh has a policy problem there, and which is a policy that in, in the case of non-garments, uh, where the choice of the producer is between exports and domestic market sales, they find that the domestic market, which is protected by high uh, tariffs, are much more profitable than exports. So unless you uh, exports have, you know, cash subsidies, uh, you know, uh, until Bangladesh. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Sattar, I yes. think we'll get into the specifics of the uh, policy framework in the next round of questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, certainly yeah. quite insightful uh, intervention. So, okay, uh, so I'll, I'll stop here then. Yeah. Uh, so. May I uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Edimon Ginting, uh, from an MDB uh, perspective, what can uh, MDB organizations like ADB do or what sh should we do or and what have we been doing to help country uh, country like Bangladesh in uh, export diversification, economic diversification and so on? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Joseph. I think that question should be addressed later after we hear a lot more from, from uh, experts like uh, Dr. Shatar. But I think, let me just also uh, synthesize some of these findings first uh, before I answer your questions. Um, I think number one, um, hang on a second. Number one, uh, I think uh, I like the, uh, the uh, chart presented by Janine, uh, the first chart, you know, you can see there that uh, growth uh, in the next, decade is projected to be lower compared to the last decade. I think that is something that uh, worry uh, policymaker here because uh, the country would like to be a uh, upper middle income country by 2031. That basically means that the country need to grow uh, around 7% annually to achieve that. So lower growth uh, trajectory down the line is, is something that is uh, problematic uh, uh, in terms of achieving that uh, goal. Yeah. Secondly, I think uh, I think Charisma presented the productivity number there too. You see, although uh, the component of the uh, within sector productivity improvement is increasing, but overall productivity is, is also uh, uh, flattening. Yeah. So those are two important uh, points that is uh, need uh, you know a deeper look, and this is actually the reason why we need to diversify. 
the productivity improvement within the current sector, within the current driver of growth, is no longer able to product uh, to support uh, you know uh, growing productivity that is needed to to support growth on the line in Bangladesh. So uh, the question of uh, 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 diversification is really, really important. Uh, uh, secondly, I think, you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Shatter was saying at, at the end of his, uh, her in, his in the intervention, it is the result of policy. Yeah, I think the result of policy, which is, uh, dual policy is, is there, where sometimes, uh, you know, uh, export sector like government receive a lot of good, uh, 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 you know, environment, policy environment for uh, export, but at the same time, uh, the, the policy also support uh, import substitutions, yeah, uh, very strongly. So that this uh, this this slower diversification is basically the result of that. So so what what the, then uh, our strategy in terms of uh, uh, helping diversification in the country in this context? Then you know, um, uh, of course, in in our country partnership strategy, number one is uh, uh, to support. Uh, uh, Higher economic growth through diversifications, but uh, in this context, the, our our traditional uh, way of supporting uh, competitiveness through infrastructure, through uh, you know uh, improving uh, road, rail, and so on, will not be sufficient because policy environment uh, uh, will, will is not yet there to really fa facilitate this uh, through diversification. I think the impact of uh, you know. Uh, uh, Competitiveness coming from the infrastructure will not be, will not be uh, translated into increased export and diversification if the environment is there. So in that, in that context, we also need to be uh, engaged in the in the policy front uh, to, to have a good dialogue with the government in these very policy issues. Um, but of course, you know, uh, trade policy is also going side by side with uh, investment policies. If you have a, a good trade policy, it's usually also uh, uh, you know, invite uh, uh, good FDI and so on. So, so in that context, I think the policy front also need, needs significant attention. So let me stop there for now. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, dig some more on some of the, the things that we do here in, in Bangladesh to help the government. Also, obviously, uh, uh, you know, I thank a colleague from ERCD for, for doing this, looking at uh, slicing the data a bit more uh, differently compared to our previous uh, publications beyond Garmin. And this will inform our dialogue and also operations in, in the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edimon. Uh, uh, in fact, your response also gave uh, insights into how we will be implementing uh, Strategy 2030 uh, in Bangladesh as well. Uh, so let me uh, uh, ask uh, Pramila for her insights. Um, now, what policy options are available? Uh, like, given the policy framework that we have uh, right now, what policy op options are available for Bangladesh for diversification and what are the challenges? And also uh, related to that, uh, sort of a counter question is, should Bangladesh be looking at diversification? Over to you. Um, thank you, Joseph. Yeah. So uh, should Bangladesh be looking at diversification? Yes, definitely. And uh, I think, uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me with you today. The presentation was really insightful. And I think, uh, yes, we learned a lot. Uh, and many things can be or should be done to diversify uh, Bangladesh economy. Now, um, I would like to bring uh, an aspect that maybe we, I believe, should be a bit discussed more deeply in this analysis is the trade policy aspects uh, with regional cooperation and mostly trade agreements and trade preferences. Uh, why? Because you ask what are the, the, the challenges that are foreseen in the near future uh, for Bangladesh in this context? Well, uh, of course, they are related to this very high concentration that we just discussed, right? Uh, there are product concentration in the ready-made garment, but also geographical um, concentration with uh, 50 or 60 percent of exports going to the European Union. And um, this can be extremely problematic in the near future in the context of uh, preference erosion, erosion and uh, graduation. So uh, let me uh, further explain what, what it means, what means preference erosion for Bangladesh and what graduation means for Bangladesh. Because uh, I've seen in the slides that graduation has been mentioned in a sense that it says like maybe further rise of wages are expected after graduation. Uh, but uh, let me say that, uh, yes, uh, Bangladesh will graduate uh, from the least developed countries category on 24 November, 2026. 
but it will graduate as a natural process because it has reached the GNI um, per capita threshold, the human asset index threshold, and the economic vulnerability threshold from the UN. So it's a, it's a natural process, but it, it doesn't mean that necessarily because of graduation, you will have further improvement. And in fact, I would say you could expect even the opposite. Uh, this is an enormous challenge uh, for Bangladesh, like for many LDCs in the region, Cambodia as well, but for Bangladesh even more, it's precisely because of this uh, concentration. And why? Well, because in the past, Bangladesh has been extremely successful in taking, um, in using trade preferences, in uh, taking advantage of trade preferences granted by um, it was mentioned by Dr. Sattar, like initially there was the market access by MFA. Uh, and then uh, the European Union, through the uh, Everything But Arms initiatives, provides uh, a very generous uh, GSP scheme to, to LDCs and to Bangladesh. And it, Bangladesh has been extremely successful in, in using these schemes, and especially uh, after 2011. And why 2011? Because it was a critical point of the European reforms of rules of origin. From 2011, there has been an enormous jump in the utilization rates of trade preferences from 40, around 40% to 90%. And they have been consistently high till then. This means that uh, like, if you think um, of, the, of the trade, like 17 billions of uh, exports to the European Union in 2021 of uh, HS Section 11, so um, garments, basically textiles, 95% uh, of this amount, 95, enters duty free. Okay. And basically before 2011, you had only 45% of this amount benefiting from the, from the future uh, market access. And now why I mentioned rules of origin is because it's very critical in the global value chain perspective, because the change that has been observed in 2011 was moving away from double transformation criteria, which means that basically uh, you have um, you have to move from yarn to fabrics and then to fabrics to garments. So it's extremely complex and difficult to, to comply with. And then after that, you have a single transformation from um, so meaning you can import fabrics and just uh, what we call cut, make and trim. You prepare your garment and you export it. So uh, when we want to foster GVCs, we need to keep that in mind in the policy context that uh, you need to comply with those rules and you need to have a certain value of domestic content. And uh, and um, if uh, after graduation, what will happen is, is very critical because either you can apply to GSP plus and get the market access or you have the normal GSP, uh, but then you will have 9% tariff applied. So imagine on 17 billions, it's quite a lot of money. Uh, but in any case, whatever happens, what is certain is that we are going to get back to a situation like before 2011, with a double transformation process uh, requirements, which uh, with 45% of utilization. So uh, I would say that in terms of options, we need to investigate how we can uh, build other uh, market access and trade preferences, maybe through regional trade agreements and further negotiations, because Bangladesh has only like five uh, ongoing, I think, um, at least agreements notified at the WTO. Uh, so we need to further you know, negotiate and support. I, th I think it has been clearly said we have a policy um, problem. We need also to raise capacities uh, to understand this negotiation and how to to negotiate further uh, further trade agreements and, and market access. Uh, I would say in the region. Now, shall we focus on GVC? Uh, my answer is very simple. It will say it depends how you define it because um, I think we should focus on domestic value added. Yes but not necessarily only on backward and forward linkages, because this is important, but in the case of Bangladesh, being at the end of the value chain, exporting ready-made garments, all these exports do not count as GVC trade if you exclude this, uh, if you take only forward and backward linkages. While I believe that uh, this can raise and have raised income in the past, and, and that should also be a priority on raising uh, the, the GDP and the income in the country. Thank you.
Oh, thanks, Pramila. It looks like there are certain policy aspects as well as uh, theoretical issues uh, that you raised uh, in your intervention. Uh, we will uh, certainly get back to them uh, during this course of this uh, session or later. Uh, a couple of uh, questions for actually for our uh, presenters, uh, probably Janine can answer. Now, how do we show um, comparative advantage in sectors like telecommunication and construction when we know there's no obvious direct cross export? Hi, Joseph. Um, actually, that's what we're trying to explore at the moment. So what we're doing is, um, like with merchandise products, right, we're able to map um, the products into the different MRIOT sectors. So what we're doing now is adding some um, services trade data so that we can further break down what's in that construction and in um, post and telecoms. But um, one of our colleagues um, did some research and said that actually the post and telecoms might be increasing because of the exports of bandwidth to India of Bangladesh in recent years. So there's like export of like 5G, 3G connection lines. Um, may I ask, is it uh, so in, in our calculation for reveal comparative advantage, we are using gross export or the, the traditional measure or the new measure? Um, both, Joseph, but we're, what we're doing is using the sectoral level. So um, as to what exactly they're exporting, um, I think that was Abdul's question. So can Bangladesh reveal comparative advantage in telecoms export? What exactly do they export? We don't have like a clear answer yet because um, remember we are adding, I think, bat this the Baptist data set into our research to see what these um services sectors are actually trying to export. Um, remember with the Baptist data set, we can sort of get some product breakdown like softwares, um, um, and other services into the mix so that we can better understand um where uh, again, the revealed comparative in experts is coming from, as well as also understand, because we're also exploring FDI, correct? So we're trying to link um, whether there's increased FDI in telecom construction and link it to the products that um, within those services sectors that uh, Bangladesh is actually exporting. Okay. Uh, Karishma, do you have any insights? Yeah, I just wanted to add that it's actually the, so within the broader ICD or digital services sector, it is actually the software um, exports that um, that rank the highest in terms of like why the RCA shows uh, high in post and telecoms. It's software exports by Bangladesh um, and, uh, and IT enabled services, BPO services. I think so those are the sectors which emerge high, but we would need to then, um, as Janine was mentioning, look at the disaggregated service level data to answer more clearly exactly which services um, Bangladesh is showing competitive competitiveness in. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, we can go to another question um, that uh, probably to Dr. Uh, Satar. Now, uh, yeah, is, is, is there any, uh, there, there seems to be like a tension between structural transformation and, and, and resilience. Um, now, how can uh, a an economy like Bangladesh uh, reconcile these two competing, seemingly competing objectives. Uh, that's a very that's a tough question to to start with. Uh, actually, uh, Bangladesh, in order to meet the challenges of the next decade and the challenge to become a middle-income country, as uh, Edimon mentioned, by 2031. Uh, we'll need to go through some structural transformation. In fact, some structural reforms. Uh, Bangladesh entered into uh, this the current mode of trade openness back in the 1990s. It switched from a highly import substituting economy to an uh, export oriented economy, embracing the export led growth strategy. And in the 1990s, Post-1990s, Bangladesh was uh, regarded as a globalizer. And as a globalizer, Bangladesh was shown to be growing faster than many other developing countries. But that transformation now requires a further transformation, further uh, you know, changes, further reforms, very radical in the area of trade policy, in the area of revenue tax policy, in the area of digitalization as well. 
Now, may I, may I add when we are all talking about diversification and where Bangladesh can diversify, let me add that Bangladesh is exporting actually about 1800 to 1900 HS6 digit products of which 250 are uh, in the ready-made garment uh, product group. But there are 1300 to 1400 HS6 digit products that Bangladesh continues to export every year, but small amounts. Only three exp exports have now reached $1 billion. The rest are even below $1 million. So why, what, what the government is doing as a policy is finding some trust sectors, the sectors that do well, okay, so let's focus on them and that's where diversification would come. But actually, I would like to suggest that more important is not picking winners, but more important is creating the, the right policy environment in which uh, Bangladesh's comparative advantage, labor intensive or skill intensive as time goes on, will be able to be exploited. And that is where, so we've got to study all these 1300 and 1400 products. And we did some comparative study also to, to see whether there is comparative advantage. And we used RCA and normalized, in fact, used normalized RCA to figure out the cross country comparative advantage, the cross, cross country advantage that Bangladesh might have. And we find that there's significant uh, advan comparative advantage for Bangladesh. However, as I mentioned before, the policy environment does not seem to favor uh, exports, but favors more domestic import substitute production and sale in the domestic market. So that is a critical, you know, policy uh, break that is needed right now for structural transformation of the export sector as well as the domestic economy diversifying the domestic economy uh, as well as diversifying the export basket seem to be um, coming together at this point. I hope, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I hope that, that clarifies some, some of the points raised. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Sattar. Um, now, a related question, I think you may have already um, um, you may have already alluded to this, um, but more specifically, what has uh, really prevented the non-RNG sectors to develop further? Uh, is it like uh, really the supply or the high prices? Or, uh, yeah, you probably know more about these specifics, uh, please. Uh, Good point. Uh, I think uh, when I mentioned all of these, I missed one point, which is the political economy of trade policy that the political economy is just as important. You see, the ready-made garment sector is now the dominating sector in the export market. So the, the, the ex, ready-made garment exporters association, which we call the Bangladesh BGMEA and the BKMEA, the knitwear exporters, these two are now uh, politically very influential. That was not the case prior to the 1990s. Now, Political economy is still important in the sense that the import substituting uh, group of producers, which is the case for non-garment sector, the entire non-garment sector, agro-processing, uh, ceramics, uh, uh, footwear and leather products, uh, plastics, uh, electronics, electrical engine, electrical products. All of these, you know, they have very high protection and the domestic import substituting lobby is so strong that, that tariff rationalization for making uh, the sectors more dynamic, more export oriented and more competitive, that, that is not happening because the domestic import substituting producers still have a very strong political lobby. They were much stronger before the 1990s, but they're still strong enough today to, you know, sort of prevent tariff rationalization from taking place. Bangladesh, if you look around, if you look at the average tariffs in Bangladesh, it is higher, <coughs> higher than the average uh, low income countries. It is higher than the average of lower middle income and upper middle income countries. Of course, it's way higher than the, the developed countries. So what is stopping 
uh, tariff rationalization, which is essential for dynamism, bringing dynamism in export and for diversification of our current export basket. Uh, it's difficult to operate in a high tariff regime by creating you know, enclaves. Uh, so the enclave system has worked so far with the ready-made garment sector, but it cannot be extended. Uh, we have tried, uh, you know, these other exports like the leather sector, the footwear sector, the plastic sector, and they, they do get the uh, facility of duty-free imports, but with you know, limitations. The, the National Board of Revenue, which is the controller, the regulator of, of tariffs, they, they are not as export-oriented as you would hope. And the customs administration, instead of being a facilitator of trade, is acting as a revenue collector. And as long as they do that, if customs administration, modern customs administration is a regular, is a revenue collector, it, it cannot facilitate export diversification and exports in particular. So that is, that is a, a conflict inherent policy conflict that is going on and structural reforms are needed in the in the tax administration as well. In order uh, to... Dr. Sattar, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll uh, stop there, but certainly we'll engage uh, with uh, further discussion on that. So may I ask uh, if uh, Edimon has uh, any further insights into the current discussion? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and Dr. Sattar and everybody for uh, your insight. I think uh, three points I would like to highlight. Number one is, uh, yes, I think uh, structural reform is badly needed in terms of uh, accelerating uh, economic diversification in, in Bangladesh. And uh, we know one of the challenges is uh, 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 trade policy. Uh, and another, another key challenge is uh, investment policy. And, and that uh, would be part of our uh, work in terms of uh, supporting L, 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 uh, L, L, DG uh, 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 LCD graduation, yeah, uh, uh, down the line for for Bangladesh. Uh, number two, I think, uh, I think the uh, the infrastructure that we built uh, is is also important uh, in, in terms of improving logistic and so on, which is uh, also uh, in, not in a very good shape now here in in Bangladesh. But at the same time, contributions of this uh, infrastructure and, and logistic and so on will not be maximized without uh, uh, conducive policy environment. Yeah. And number three, I think we learned from uh, experience in our uh, DMCs in, in Asia, uh, you know, again about productivity. Uh, in early stage, productivity uh, usually come from capital investment and so on. Later, uh, come a bit more from uh, uh, human resources, but down the line, uh, it'll come from innovations. I think Bangladesh also need to in improve productivity that comes from uh, human resources and innovation and so on. In that context, uh, I think ADB will also be supporting uh, human resource development and also uh, innovations down the line. Let me stop there. Thank you. Yes, Thank sir. you, Edimon. Uh, Pramila, your last uh, intervention, closing intervention, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, first of all, thank you for um, all these interventions. They were really interesting. I think I would like to reflect again on these um, policy aspects. I think uh, I think Dr. Sattar really rightly pointed out that uh, we need a regulatory framework uh, and an environment that is kind of business friendly and uh, that allows uh, structural transformation. And uh, I think he has, he has mentioned that some analysis have been conducted to look at other comparative advantage in other sectors than just uh, textile and clothing, and also cross-country comparison to see where Bangladesh has a comparative advantage compared to other countries. And uh, I would like to suggest also in this type of analysis to think of the demand side, because looking at the comparative advantages, we look at the supply side mostly, but it's also important to identify the market and the demand. And uh, uh, well, um, in the Aid for Trade uh, in Asia and the Pacific report uh, that we launched uh, in July this year um, at ADB, we have conducted some uh, preliminary an analysis on, on that and also discuss the case of Bangladesh and Bangladesh graduation. And uh, I'd like to <laughs> suggest that if people are interested to look at it, and but to look at um, alternative export destinations. So basically, uh, you know, when you're looking at these uh, sectors that are have the potential to be further developed, uh, maybe uh, to 
complement the garment and uh, industry, try to um, identify which countries are the most, the, the biggest importers, and these countries, where do they currently import from to understand who would be your competitor if you were to enter this market? And then also look at the policy aspect of, is it possible to sign an agreement with this country? Can we negotiate? Uh, is this country part of a bigger agreement like RCEP or like CPTPP? Maybe can I join or what, you know, what are the different policy options? And same thing for digital. You have the digital economy agreements, digital agreements that are now uh, developing. Uh, indeed, it's mostly for developed economies at the moment, but I think it's important to, you know, keep uh, at least following those negotiations to try to understand how in the future it could benefit Bangladesh. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Pramila. So before closing, I would like to uh, inform you all that our uh, next webinar uh, would be on 10th of November, uh, starting at 2 p.m. Uh, Manila time. It will be on the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and uh, the impact on small firms in Central and uh, West Asia. So uh, I would like to thank you all for your participation and uh, the questions and the interventions. And we uh, certainly gathered um, uh, information and insights that we can take forward in our research work. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good, good evening. Thank you.